Hello, I'm Kendall House, and in this presentation, we're going to start looking at Darwin's theories of evolution. I hope you enjoy it. Hello, and this presentation is called, What is Evolution? The first four Darwinian theories. And when we talk about evolution, we're really talking about a complex of concepts. So Darwin spoke of his work as one long argument. And in fact, that long argument was a web of interconnected arguments. And in making those arguments, Darwin transformed existing ideas. It's a really interesting thing how scientific theories uh, come to take shape, and Darwin's an interesting study in that. Now our key source in how I'm going to approach this, I'm going to draw very heavily on a famous evolutionary biologist named Ernst Mayer, and his book, What Evolution Is, which I highly recommend to you. So Mayer talks about Darwin's six theories of evolution. And in this presentation, we're going to look at the first four of those. And the first is simply evolution as such. And what we mean by evolution as such is simply change. So one of the simplest definitions of evolution is change. And indeed, in population genetics, evolution is defined as the changing gene frequencies in a population. And of course, the idea Darwin was challenging uh, with his focus on change uh, was the fixity of species, the idea that nothing had changed uh, since the world was created and that all living things were created distinct from one another. His second theory is the theory of common descent. And this is the argument that all living things have shared ancestry. And of course, that was also in opposition to the theory of separate creation. And Darwin took a lot of heat uh, for suggesting that humans have shared ancestry. Uh, usually that heat was focused on our nearest relations, other primates, but in an evolutionary perspective, we have shared ancestry even with bacteria. And the evidence that Darwin drew on was well known by the 19th century. It was there in uh, Linnaeus' uh, classification of living things. And one thing that you could look at is commonalities in anatomy. So when we look across closely related things, uh, their anatomy is simply a variation on one another. And we have to look a little closer as those relations get more distant. But here's an illustration. Uh, this is an illustration of primate feet uh, made based on the information then available in 1893. And as we've discussed, uh, humans are primates, and one way that we exhibit that is in having uh, 10 fingers and 10 toes, something that we share uh, with the other primates. We also have primate vision and primate eyes, particularly uh, we're close to the old world monkeys and apes on this. So we have forward-facing eyes that allow binocular depth perception, and we have trichromatic color vision. And the color vision in humans is shared then by the apes and the old world monkeys. So we can say that you're looking at the world with primate eyes and you're touching the world with primate hands. Now, as we get out further in terms of relationships, it gets a little more complex. Um, but uh, today, genetic comparisons can be used. And a study in 1994 quite surprisingly showed that humans have some genes in common with bread yeast. So this is quite interesting. 
The article's title was Genes Conserved in Yeast and Humans. And these are genes that uh, don't change because presumably mutations in some genes are fatal. And so that's called negative selection when a mutation uh, destroys the organism. And this will cause genes to be conserved, and these are talked about as fossil genes. So it was thought uh, before this that genes were always changing, but now uh, we know that some genes are very stable and others change quite quickly, and this depends upon the outcomes of those mutations. So we can draw from this, though, a basic principle that was really important in Darwin's thinking, and that is just that how much we share is a measure of our common ancestry. So organisms that are more closely related are expected to resemble one another more. And as an example of that, the human genome is 99.9% .9 invariant across humanity. So all living humans basically have the same genome. If we compare our genome to chimpanzees, it's 98% shared. And obviously then we're much more closely related to one another than to chimps. And that makes sense given that the last common ancestor of all humans is perhaps 100 to 150,000 years ago. Whereas the last common ancestor between living chimps and humans is 4 to 5 million years ago. Darwin's third theory is descent with modification. And Darwin often spoke of it as the principle of divergence, which he was terribly interested in. Um, how do living things diversify? And his answer was descent with modification. And of course, this opposed the idea that all living things were distinct and formed stable types. So what Darwin was more or less doing was showing kinship across living things at the same time, he was arguing for dynamics and change. So one way that we can look at how humans diverge from other primates is in terms of our appendages again, and our feet are different, and this is because we're bipedal. So because you're bipedal, uh, your big toe is in line rather than diverging like this orangutan in the photo. And that's just one thing that's different about you as a bipedal primate. And in a sense, uh, what we call the bipedal adaptation is a suite of traits that stretch from our toes uh, to our head. So up in the base of our skull, we can also look at bipedal locomotion in relation to the position of what's called the foramen magnum. And this is the hole in the base of your skull where your spinal cord comes in. On a human, uh, that's relatively central. It's at the center. Whereas on a chimpanzee, it's towards the back of the skull. And this reflects a difference in how we stand. The chimpanzee uh, down on its knuckles, a human upright. And the shifting location of the foramen magnum then is very important to maintaining our center of gravity. Beyond that, if we drift down from the foramen magnum and look at your spine, it's S-shaped, and that's an adaptation of bipedality. Your rib cage is barrel-shaped, whereas the other apes have a funnel-shaped rib cage, and that's because they have to do a lot more movement with their arms as they're knuckle walking. Your pelvis is shorter and wider than the pelvis of a gorilla or a chimpanzee. Your knees stay together. That means when we're standing, our upper thigh bones tend to point inward, whereas in apes, they point outward. And of course, your legs are considerably longer than your arms, and that reverses things from the situation in chimps and gorillas. They have very long arms relative to humans and short legs relative to humans. So from this we can draw a basic uh, principle of evolution and it's just like history. So evolution is about a historical process 
And like all history, we can see both continuity and change. So we can say that you're an evolved primate and you differ from other primates. And at the same time, we can argue that you share features with other primates that reflect shared ancestry. And both of these arguments together are necessary for evolutionary analysis. Darwin's fourth theory, and the last one that we're going to examine in this presentation, is gradualism. And this is the idea that evolution moves by small steps, a little bit at a time. And of course, if evolution is very slow and gradual, that will require a lot of time. In the 19th century, we have Darwinian evolutionary theory. We also have the discovery of deep time by geologists, and later astronomers and physicists are very important in that. Deep time and geology played a major role in Darwin's reflections. Um, these ideas opposed the idea of a young Earth whose features had been shaped by recent massive catastrophes. And Darwin then was able to build his thinking from the assumption that evolution had occurred over very long periods of time. And this is the Canadian shield. It's shown on this map in red. And this is the oldest uh, rock in North America, this massive area. And it's Precambrian in age, so that means it's over 500 million years old. And this poses a problem uh, which geologists face, as well as paleontologists and paleoanthropologists. How can we observe what happened in the past, uh, particularly millions of years ago? How do we know what happened then? And an answer to that question was given by a geologist named Charles Lyell, who was a correspondent with Darwin and influenced him, although they disagreed on many things. And one of Lyell's key contributions to geology is the principle of uniformitarianism. And this simply means that geological processes that are observable today were also happening in the past so that we can extrapolate from what we can see happening today into past time periods. So let's sum up uh, what we've discussed so far. We've said that Darwinian thinking, which became the foundation of evolutionary biology, is that life begins with one origin, and then uh, via descent with modification, life diverged into ever new forms, taking small gradual steps over immense spans of time. Thank you for listening, and there'll be more to come.